Mr. President, for more than 50 years, the federal government has provided students with grants and loans to help pay for college. That's a public-private partnership between the government and students, between our taxpayers and students. It's an investment premised on the idea that a higher education will improve life for the borrower and also will strengthen our society by giving more Americans the knowledge and skills to get better jobs and to be able to give back to their communities. I know firsthand how higher education can transform one's life. I went to college on student loans and the law school on the GI Bill. That's why I've spent my career in Congress fighting to ensure that all students who wish to learn, who wish to get a college degree, are, also have an opportunity to do so. I've worked on the Appropriations Committee to expand funding for Pell Grants and student support programs. And now, as the HELP Committee Chairman, I've worked to expand Pell Grants to make sure our student loan programs are well run. In the past two years, Congress has provided significant new resources to help students to access and finance a college education. In 2008, we increased the amount of Stafford loans that undergraduates can borrow by $2,000 a year. The Recovery Act of 2009 provided another $17 billion to the Pell Grant program. The recent reconciliation law added another $36 billion to Pell Grants over the next 10 years. So the Congress has made hard choices to secure these increases for financial aid programs. The money is an investment in our nation's students and also in our country's future. For that investment to pay off, we must ensure that students are being well-educated and that schools are using federal dollars responsibly. To ensure that our investment is paying off, earlier this year I initiated an oversight investigation into one part of the higher education system, the for-profit education companies. Education companies that also make a profit for shareholders and investors are growing at an astonishing pace. Enrollments, profits, and share of the federal financial aid budget going to those schools are skyrocketing. In 2008, these schools, these for-profit schools, accounted for 10% of the students enrolled in higher education. But those students received 23% of federal student loans and grants and they accounted for 44% of the defaults. Again, for-profit schools, 10% of the students got 23% of the federal loans and grants and accounted for 44% of the defaults. So confronted with numbers like these, I became increasingly concerned that a significant share of our federal investment in higher education is being misused and that some companies are using the federal aid program as a cash machine to drive up profits as their main purpose. Across the country, some higher education companies are using a high-pressure sales force, persuading consumers in search of the American dream to go deep into debt to purchase a product of often dubious value. Default rates are sky high. Taxpayer money is being squandered. Top executives walking away with fortunes. Now, you might think I was talking about the subprime mortgage industry, which came crashing down two years ago, because that does describe it. But what I just described is also the situation created by many for-profit colleges. Just as in the subprime mortgage crisis, countless thousands of ordinary Americans are being harmed in the reckless pursuit of profits by a few. This summer, I heard testimony from Ms. Yasmin Issa, a single mother of twin girls, Two years ago, she went back to school to earn her degree in medical sonography. She went online, typed in sonography, and found an advertisement for the Sanford Brown Institute, Institute part of a chain of for-profit colleges owned by Career Education Corporation, a publicly traded company. The folks at Sanford Brown sold Mrs. Issa on the value of their program. They told her how it would help her provide for her daughters. So she enrolled and paid out $29,000 for an 18-month program. Now, the recruiters at Sanford Brown did not tell her that she could have gone to the local community college and received the same degree for $7,000. They also didn't bother to tell her that her degree at Sanford Brown wouldn't even allow her to sit for the sonography exam. Or they didn't tell her that without passing the exam, she would not be able to work as a sonographer. So after $29,000 invested, 18 months of hard work, 
Miss Issa couldn't even sit for the exam. Now, Miss Issa is not alone, but she and students like her are the reason I decided that we in Congress needed to take a closer look at this for-profit college situation. After three hearings, I believe it is an important time to report back to the Senate on what we have found to date. So today, I'm going to take the time to walk through the findings of each of these three hearings, talk about the problems facing students and taxpayers, and conclude by talking about where the HELP Committee investigation is going in the coming year. Now, the first hearing, what are for-profit colleges? We held our first hearing in June, following dozens of troubling reports about students being ripped off by for-profit colleges. The New York Times, Bloomberg News, Frontline, even Good Housekeeping had reported extensively about the growth of federally funded for-profit higher education corporations. Our first task was to get a sense of what these for-profit colleges were, how big they were, how well were they serving our students. Given that these companies receive almost all of their revenue from federal dollars, one would think that all of this information would be easily available to the public and not require a congressional investigation to unearth. But unfortunately, that was not the case. First, what are for-profit colleges? For-profit colleges, or quote, proprietary institutions, as they are known in the law, are institutions of higher education that provide a program of training to prepare students for gainful employment in a recognized occupation. Essentially, when we created the Federally Financial Aid Program back in 1965, we recognized that career or vocational schools, as they were then known, career vocational schools, most of them were privately owned, played a valuable role in our education system, and that the people who attended the schools should be able to get financial aid to attend them. At the same time, we required these schools to demonstrate that students were being prepared for gainful employment in a recognized occupation, something we do not require of two- and four-year programs at public and nonprofit schools. So today we find ourselves in a world where proprietary schools offer everything, from basic skills training to liberal arts graduate degrees, and for-profit schools enroll not a few hundred students, but in some cases, a few hundred thousand students. Now, if these schools were providing high-quality education to most of their students, those numbers would be a cause for celebration. Instead, they are a cause for concern. And these concerns are long-standing. Twenty years ago, former Senator Sam Nunn of Georgia held a series of hearings looking at the for-profit sector. And because of the problems they found, they initiated a series of legislative fixes to ensure that for-profit schools were a good investment for students and taxpayers. As with many laws, 20 years have taken their toll, and those reforms have been almost completely rolled back. We find ourselves today facing some of the same problems, with few tools in place to provide genuine oversight of our taxpayers' investment. What hasn't changed is that unlike public or non-profit schools, proprietary schools are legally bound, legally bound, to operate in the interests of their owners. As the companies have gotten larger, they've been transformed from mom and pop operations into high growth, high investment, big businesses. 15 for-profit education companies that operate 69 schools with an enrollment of 1.5 million are actually publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange or on NASDAQ. Another 33 for-profit education companies operating 65 more for-profit schools are at least partially owned by private equity investors or hedge funds. Hedge funds. The result is that the vast majority of for-profit schools have prioritized growth over education in order to satisfy the demands of their investors. In fact, growth and return on investment for shareholders is their legal obligation. So it shouldn't surprise us that educating students is taking a back seat to just getting more bodies in the door. Growth. 
For-profit colleges traded in the stock market are a relatively recent phenomenon that has created a drastically transformed landscape for us here in Congress, legislators. As I said, in 1992, the last time Congress took a serious look at this sector under Senator Nunn, there were no publicly traded for-profit higher education institutions. None. Zero. In 2010, 15 publicly traded institutions enrolling hundreds of thousands of students are in existence. Now, that's just publicly traded. There are many, many more that are equity-owned, owned by equity investors or hedge funds, which also did not exist 20 years ago. To satisfy shareholders, publicly traded schools must constantly focus on growth, measuring up to Wall Street's laser-like attention to quarterly enrollment statistics. Publicly traded schools must also generate higher revenues while keeping down costs, including teaching costs. These schools do this by raising tuition, increasing the number of enrolled students, which in turn increases the amount of federal student aid dollars flowing to the schools. But it doesn't necessarily do anything about the quality of the education received. A focus on growth at the expense of student outcomes is not just the province of the publicly traded companies. As I said, increasingly hedge funds and private equity firms invest in for-profit colleges and manage the business end of the operation. For example, how many people know that Goldman Sachs, yes, the same Goldman Sachs, is the owner of more than one-third of the publicly traded EDMC? That's a for-profit college, which is an, the operator of something called the Art Institute and Brown Mackey. These are colleges. These are for-profit schools. A vice president and a managing director of Goldman Sachs sit on the EDMC board. These firms are interested in short-term profit and have no interest in the long-term educational outcomes of the students attending the schools. It certainly isn't clear to the students that the school is owned by a bunch of Wall Street investors. I, I had this chart printed up here. This is not all of them, but these, these are for-profit schools owned by private equity and hedge funds that we were able to come up with right away. I mean, how, how many students signing up at uh, Rasmussen College or Morrison University or uh, the Institute for Business and Technology or uh, Beckfield College or or uh, Chancellor University or Ashworth College, Florida Coastal School of Law. How many students sign up for this know that they're owned by private equity investors or hedge funds that operate these schools? They sound like they're just legitimate kind of colleges. An estimated 1.3 out of 1.8 million students attending for-profit schools in 2008 were attending schools primarily owned by Wall Street investors. Let me repeat that. Out of 1.8 million students going to for-profit colleges in 2008, 1.3 million students were attending colleges primarily owned by Wall Street investors. Again, this landscape didn't ha wasn't around 20 years ago. In fact, most of it wasn't around 10 years ago. Here's how the hedge fund owners of Westwood College, Westwood College down here someplace, we have Westwood College here. The uh, hedge fund owners of Westwood College state on their website, quote, they always keep their eye on the ball of what is best for the business over the long term. Not students, not the education of students, but they keep their eye on the ball of what's best for the business, the hedge fund. Funny, I thought the ball that we should be keeping our eye on was how good a job we're doing educating students with taxpayers' money. Westwood, I should add, is under investigation by the Attorney General in Colorado. It's had its operation shut down in Texas and has been told not to operate online in Wisconsin. No accrediting agency actually seems willing to acknowledge that it accredits this school. Yet Westwood College turned a profit of $46.7 million in 2009. To $46.7 million, owned by a hedge fund. While we call these schools for profits to distinguish them from public community colleges and four year colleges and the nonprofit universities, 
It's really a misnomer since they are largely federally funded through students, loans, grants, and military benefits. As a group, that our committee looked at, as a group, these publicly traded companies receive at least 85.6% of their revenue from federal dollars of one sort or another. That's for profit. Under current law, under current law, these companies cannot get more than 90% of their revenue from student loans and grants. We call it the 90-10 rule. Now, to me, that seems like a lot. But for these companies, it's not enough. According to an internal lobbying document from the Career College Association released by the New America Foundation, one of the top priorities for the for-profit college trade association is to roll back that rule and increase the amount of federal dollars these companies can get from the government. 90% isn't enough. Well, they've clearly done a good job. Since at least six of the companies, Kaplan, ECPI, TUI, ACC, Remington, and Vatterot get more than 90% of revenues from the federal government. Now you might say, wait a second, Senator Harkin, I thought you just said they're limited to 90% by law. True, here's how they get around it. The University of Phoenix, for example, in its SEC reporting, acknowledged that in 2009 it received 89% of the revenues from Stafford loans and Pell grants. Document requests that we got indicate they received an additional 1.5% of revenues from other federal sources, including military benefits. That means that even the largest for-profit school, Phoenix, is likely re is receiving more than 90% of their revenues from federal taxpayer dollars. Now, again, how do they do that? Because if you get military money, that's not counted in the 90%. That's counted in the 10% that's kind of, quote, private. Let's get that again. If they enroll a military person who gets GI Bill benefits and they put it into these schools, that's not counted as part of the 90%. That's, that's what their nice lobbying got done for them. So they don't abide by 90%. Some of them get more than 90% of their money from federal government. So again, uh, just looking at Phoenix, the University of Phoenix took in more than $1 billion in Pell Grants last year. $1 billion in Pell Grants, more than $3 billion in federal student loans, $4 billion in revenue from American taxpayers for just one company in one year. More than 93% of the students at these schools take out federal student loans, and the loans go to these schools. By relying so heavily on federal subsidies, these for-profit colleges have privatized the process of collecting federal subsidies, but they left the students holding the bag for the cost of a subpar education at a very high price. Of course, the term for-profit is not completely misplaced because regardless of how poorly students perform, as long as these companies can demonstrate enrollment growth, they remain profitable. In 2009, the same 30 schools that received 85% of revenues from federal dollars generated $3.5 billion in profits for the hedge funds, the equity investors, or stockholders, shareholders. Together, the schools, get this, Mr. President, together the schools last year, together, all the schools, had a profit margin of 19%. How many businesses in the state of West Virginia have a profit margin of 19%, I ask, or Iowa? But that's average. Some schools had profit margins of 33%. The highest we found was 36%. 36% profit margin last year. And where'd the money come from? Taxpayers, the taxpayers of America. Not a, not a bad deal if you can get it, huh? And then, and then look at what happened with the executive salaries. So that 85 to 90% plus of their revenues coming from the taxpayers really paid for some high executive salaries. Business Week recently reported that the CEO of Strayer, Strayer, one of these schools, Strayer, was paid $41.6 million last year. 
That's the president of a school. 26 times the highest salary paid to a nonprofit or public university president. 26 times, probably more than that, at the University of West Virginia or the University of Iowa or Iowa State. Combined, the executives at the 15 publicly traded schools received $2 billion from the sale of stock over the last seven years. Let me repeat that. Over the last seven years, these executives that run these schools started dumping stock. They started selling all their stock back. And you know what they got? $2 billion in the last seven years from the sale of their stock. You know, if they loved these schools so much, you think they'd be investing the money in the schools to help some of these students, maybe tutoring, some kind of support mechanisms for these poor students that come in that don't have an experience of going to school, that they would be doing everything they could to make sure that students who came in stayed and didn't drop out. Uh, they sold stock, walked away with $2 billion in the last seven years. The co-CEO of the company that owns the University of Phoenix was paid $11.3 million last year. That's more than seven times the $1.6 million paid to the highest paid head of a nonprofit, more than 14 times, I just found out here, the compensation paid to the president of Harvard. <laughs> Boy, they're walking away with money. Well, that was our first hearing. What are these schools? Now, our second hearing that we had in August, we featured testimony from the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, focused on how for-profit schools go about recruiting students. We had heard companies, these private schools, complain that their rapid growth was nothing more than students voting with their feet. Unfortunately, the GAO and our witnesses, including a former recruiter at Westwood College, I just mentioned, made clear that for-profit college growth is actually the result of an aggressive, well-funded marketing effort by the schools, including lies and deception. Using undercover agents and hidden cameras, GAO presented a troubling picture of student recruitment. Undercover investigators from GAO visited 15 campuses of 12 companies, 15 campuses of 12 companies, and they found misleading, deceptive, overly aggressive, or fraudulent practice, practices at every one of those campuses, every single one. We watched the films. We watched them, they had these little hidden cameras and microphones. We watched them in our committee hearing. Startling, startling. Students were lied to about the cost of the program, about what they could expect to earn, about how many students graduated, whether their credits would transfer, and whether the program was accredited. They were misled about whether their student loans were dischargeable in bankruptcy, and even were prevented from having a conversation with a financial aid officer until after they signed on the dotted line. So you sign on the dotted line, then you get to talk to the financial aid officer. That doesn't happen at West Virginia University or Iowa State. You can see the financial aid officer and see what you're eligible for before you decide to go there. Now, I, I want to just digress for a minute, Mr. President, about this dischargeable in bankruptcy. That's one thing that very few of these students know. Let's face it, a lot of these students are, 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 come from low-income families, and I'll get to that also in a minute. Uh, they haven't probably had a good educational experience in, 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 in secondary school, but they want to better themselves. And so they listen to this high, high pressure sales tactics what they don't know is if they borrow this money, and, and, and the other thing these schools do, they get these kids online and stuff, and they call them on the phone, and then they say, don't worry about anything, we'll fill out all the paperwork. We'll take care of all the paperwork, and based upon what you said, you're eligible for this much Pell Grant, you'll get the money, and, or, and loans, and you can get these federal loans. And we'll take care of all the paperwork. You don't have to worry about a thing. You just sign up. What the students don't know is that the loan they're taking out can never be discharged. Never, until they die. Now, we talk a lot about the subprime and how many people were left with houses they bought and they couldn't pay for. But here's one difference. You can walk away from the house. If you buy a car and you get a loan on a car and you can't make it, you can walk away from the car. Students cannot walk away from these debts. Once that school gets that money, 
and they drop out, they got that debt hanging around their neck. And you know what happens, and I'll get to this later too, those students then can't go on to another school. They can't get another loan. They can't do anything until they pay that debt. The federal government will be after them on that debt. Even when they get Social Security, they'll go after their Social Security payments. How many students would borrow $29,000 if they knew that? If they knew, you, that debt will be yours until you pay it off. They don't know that. They drop out of school, they think they borrowed the money, they gave it to the school, and that's it. Not true. And schools don't really inform them of this. The committee received recruitment training manuals from several different campuses. They have one thing in common, manipulation. Get this, and this is written up. They encourage their sales staff, to, sales staff to identify the emotional weaknesses of prospective students, to exploit the pain to motivate students to enroll. Again, don't take it from me. A recent Business Week article described a document from Kaplan University that urged recruiters to focus on, quote, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt of their prospective students. These recruitment practices are more like caricatures of boiler room sales tactics than trying to get someone a good education. These abusive recruitment practices result in students unprepared or poorly matched to their academic programs with a high probability of dropping out, leaving a school not with a degree, but with a mountain of debt. Some for-profit companies spend in excess of 30% of total cost just to fund an aggressive sales force. 30% of total cost just in their sales force. These abusive practices so widespread that GAO found them at every campus of every company it visited are the symptoms of a very sick industry. While GAO made some minor revisions and clarification to the long list of misleading practices that it documented and that the industry has now tried hard to use to discredit the work of the GAO, the essential finding stands that every single school engaged in misrepresentation, deception, or outright fraud. I urge anyone interested to go to our committee website, the HELP Committee website, and listen to those GAO tapes for themselves. In fact, the 30 companies from which I requested information spent a combined $4.12 billion in marketing in fiscal year 2009. $4.12 billion they spent on marketing and if you say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, just think, 85% of that came from the taxpayers. Six companies, Apollo, Walden, Grand Canyon, Bridgepoint, Strayer, and ITT, actually spent more than 50% of their revenues on a combination of marketing and profit. So you add up their marketing and their profit over 50% of their revenues. The second HELP Committee hearing made clear to me that the problems of the for-profit sector cannot be chalked up to a few bad actors. The opportunity for great profit in spite of poor student outcomes has become the business model in this sector. I became worried that this approach, characterized by aggressive recruitment, high cost, high debt, low graduation rates, was creating a vortex, sucking in even the good actors in the industry. I mean, think about this business model. Think about it. If you're one of these for private schools, these for-profit schools, you make the most money by recruiting the poorest students. Now, here's why. Because if you get the poorest student, Mr. President, they're eligible for the maximum Pell Grant. You get the poorest student, they're eligible for the maximum federal loans. And that's profit. <laughs> that's profit to these companies. So they are the business model, and since they, the companies, are legally bound to try to increase their returns either to their equity investors or hedge funds or their shareholders, they have to have this growth. So they keep aggressively recruiting more students. And the poorer you are, the better they like it. Gives them more money. And then, if you drop out, no skin off their teeth. They don't, they don't know you anything. So the poor students get recruited. They don't get any support, or very little, little help. They drop out. I'll show, have a chart show you that after a bit. And they got all this debt, and the schools have all the money. That's the business model. That's the business model.
The HELP Committee held its third and most recent hearing in September with a focus on answering the question, what is happening to all the students that these schools are pushing so hard to bring in the door, the ones I just talked about? Unfortunately, according to information provided by the 30 schools and analyzed by our HELP Committee, it appears these students are not faring very well. At the 30 companies we analyzed, 54% of the students who came in the door in the 2008-2009 school year had left without a, a degree by the following years. Okay, At 30 companies that we analyzed, 54% of the students who came in the door that year left the following year without a degree. They just vanished. 54%. One out of every two. They just left. That number is striking. We know from the Department of Education that nearly every student at a for-profit college will take out a federal student loan. And of course, they'll get their Pell Grants, too. That means that more than half these students are enrolling, being saddled with debt, dropping out without a degree. The numbers are even worse when we look specifically at students enrolled in associate's degree programs. Associate's degree programs. These, these, this chart here will show this. The chart here shows that shows the 10 associate's degree programs with the worst outcomes for students, these 10 here. The column in yellow shows the percentage of students leaving right here. So here's the institution, total students. Here's the withdrawal rate. This is the withdrawal rate in the first year. In the first year, 84 percent from Bridgepoint. Bridgepoint, 84.4 percent of the students that signed up dropped out in the first year. What do you think happened to their loans? What do you think happened to their Pell Grants? Students get those back? Not in your life. Bridgepoint kept them. Went to their shareholders. In that program, Bridgepoint, 84 percent, nearly all of the 7,900 students that they have left before attaining their associate's degree. I'm not talking about a bachelor's degree, I'm talking about a two-year degree. Nearly 70% at the second school, Lincoln, with the rest in the 60% range. So they had 69% didn't finish. Now, just among these 10 schools here, 375,000 students enrolled, enrolled in the 2008-2009 school year. Nearly 250,000 dropped out with a, without a degree a year later. 250,000. This is staggering numbers. Now behind them are students who are fed up with the lack of help or support from the school. Behind these numbers, they can no longer justify the level of debt they're taking on because they realize the dream job that the recruiters sold them on isn't waiting at the end. And I should be clear that these are not the complete dropout rates. More students are actually likely to quit by the time we would actually measure that. These are students who are gone within a year, many of whom never even register in the Department of Education's annual enrollment count. Guess where they're counted, though? They're counted by investors looking to value the company and measure its likely profit. So when I say all these students dropped out, it, that's just one year. How many dropped out the second year? We don't know that. Now let me focus for a moment on Bridgepoint. Bridgepoint operates Ashford Universities based sort of in Clinton, Iowa. A group of private equity investors purchased a small Catholic school in 2004 when it had about 375 students. Now, that's that, in 2004, this small Catholic school in Clinton, Iowa had 375 students. They transformed it into a transformed it into a for-profit school. It now has 67,000 students. A 17,000 percent increase in student population in six years. 17,000 percent. Now Ashford still operates the small campus in Iowa. About 600 students go there. The other 67,000 take classes online. I obviously was very interested to know how the heck they can be doing such a good job for students with that kind of growth. What the data we have collected through our investigation can tell us for the first time is that they're not doing a very good job for their students. 84% of the students seeking an associate degree and 63% of bachelor degree 
st seeking students leave Ashford within a year without finishing their programs. But look at the growth, 17,000% growth. We know this isn't terribly surprising because Bridgepoint offers no tutoring or other student services. If a student starts to have difficulties at Ashford Online, they have two options. Talk to their part-time teacher online or ask the computer avatar who is the Online Student Resource Center. Should a student succeed in completing a degree at Ashford, they had best not expect a lot of help finding a job. While Bridgepoint employs 1,703 recruiters, they employ, get this, they employ just one person to handle career planning. They employ 1,703 recruiters, one person to handle career plan, uh, planning. For the entire student body of 67,000 students, one person for career planning and placement. According to a recent study, 60% of all community college students need extra help to succeed in school. They need tutoring and classes to make up for they may not, what, what they may not have learned in middle school and high school. For-profit colleges have serve a similar population with similar needs. As they often remind us, the for-profit sector serves a group of students that has, quote, traditionally lacked access to higher education. Their students are the ones who are the most vulnerable, the ones who didn't have parents, maybe who went to college, who didn't grow up in a fairly wealthy household. And to make it through college, they require a significant support structure not available at these for-profit schools. Like Bridgepoint, schools that have large online programs seem to have particularly troubling outcomes. This becomes clear when you look at a large publicly traded school that has both a large online program and a large campus-based program for associate's degree-seeking students. Now, again, I'm talking about a two-year degree. You can see it on this chart. Career Education Corporation, that's another one of these for-profit schools, has a withdrawal rate of 44% on their campus-based programs, a whopping 69.5% in their online programs. Campus-based programs, withdrawal rate 44%, online withdrawal rate 69.5%. So something's very wrong here. To me, this, this suggests that these online students are not getting the support they need. You know, it's inexpensive for a school to enroll a student online, but to ensure that those students are learning and succeeding would require a major investment that for-profit schools obviously are not willing to make. What these high dropout numbers illustrate is a phenomenon called churn. Churn, C-H-U-R-N, churn. That's an industry term for bringing in students, signing them, up for, signing them up for loans and Pell Grants, and then leaving them to sink or swim. And then they go out the door and they bring in more. That's what they call churning through the students. Because so many students at these for-profit schools come in the door and then leave within four months, five months, six months, Many of these students don't even show up in the data that the Department of Education collects. So at Bridgepoint, for example, we're at Bridgepoint. At Bridgepoint, on the first day of classes in fall 2009, there were about 48,000 students signed up. Over the next year, recruiters signed up 77,000 additional students. Okay, let's keep these figures straight. Fall of 2009, 48,000 48, students signed up for Bridgepoint. In the next year, they signed up 77,000 additional students. Then at the end of that school year in 2010, there were only 67,000 total students enrolled. <laughs> that means that the school's actual head count for that year was about 125,000 students enrolled at some point. But 58,000 students, nearly half of them, didn't stick around. They were out the door. Now, these are the kind of things that people don't know. This is what our investigation has uncovered. And by getting the documentation that led us to these figures. The picture is much the same at other for-profit schools. In fact, most schools that we've analyzed 
recruit at least the equivalent of their entire starting student population anew each year. Again, that bears repeating. Most of the schools that we analyzed recruit at least the equivalent of their entire starting student population anew every year. Now, this is the University of Phoenix. We've all heard of the University of Phoenix. If you've never heard of them, you don't watch TV or read the newspapers or ride a bus or anything else to see all their ads. They do a great job of advertising. At the University of Phoenix, in 2008, right here, 2008, 2009, the school started the year with 443,000 students. 443,000 students. They ended the school year with 470,800 students. So about, uh, what's that, 20, 27, almost 28,000 students increased, okay? 27,800 to be exact. So they grew their enrollment by 27,800. In fact, they actually recruited and enrolled 371,700 new students in that year to get 27,800. Again, these numbers can get a little confusing. Let me try it again. University of Phoenix started the school year in 2008 with 443,000 students. They ended the school year with 470,800, a growth of 27,800 students. How did they get 27,800? They recruited 371,700 students just to get that 27,800. That means almost 350,000 students passed through the University of Phoenix in 2009 without anything to show for it. They came in, a lot of them gave them their Pell Grants, they turned over their student loans, and then they vanished. And the students got the debt, and the University of Phoenix, a nice little profit, a nice little profit. I should say a nice big profit. At another company, EDMC, the marketing and recruiting machine signed up 124,000, get this, 124,000 new students in the last school year. But they ended the year with only 19,000 more students than when they started. Recruiters for these schools face the imperative of enrolling large numbers of new students each year to replace those dropping out and eventually reach the point where the number of new students is sufficient to actually cause enrollment to grow. That's what the shareholders demand. That's what the hedge funds who own them demand. That's what their equity investors demand. So the schools may be very successful as companies making profits for their investors and their owners. And I might say huge compensation for their executives and their presidents. It's hard to say that they're, that they're successful as educational institutions. Would Senator yield for a question? I'd be delighted to yield to my friend. I'd like to ask the senator from Iowa. You know, most people say, well, businesses ought to have their opportunity to make a profit. That's what America is all about. What percentage of the revenues, at, like at the University of Phoenix, come from federal taxpayers? Well, I'm, I'm glad the senator asked that question. I've been through that earlier, but I'll go over it again. Uh, at the University of Phoenix, as you know, there's a federal law that says they can only get 90% of their revenue. 90%. 90% from federal uh, uh, sources, loans or grants, uh, Pell Grants, loans, that type of thing. 90%. Well, the University of Phoenix reported last year they got 89% of their money from the federal government. But here's the kicker. If you are a GI and they recruit you, and you're giving them your GI Bill benefits and other educational benefits that you get through the military, that's not counted in the 90%. For some reason, that's not taxpayer money. So actually, the University of Phoenix got more than 90% of their money from the taxpayers of this country. And I might follow up if the senator would allow another question through the chair. And didn't we ask the GAO to do a study, incidentally, or the Department of Defense to do a study about the GI Bill benefits? and how much uh, we were actually spending through the GI Bill for education through the for-profit schools compared to the public schools, community colleges, colleges and universities. We asked for that number and we ended up, if I'm not mistaken, learning 
that these for-profit schools were charging GIs and veterans three times, three times the amount that was being charged uh, for those who went through other traditional schools, public schools and universities. And it strikes me that we have a legitimate concern. I know the senator from Iowa and myself have been dutifully and loyally voting for federal aid to education. I don't know his story. My story is I'm standing here today because of a, a National Defense Education Act loan, government loan, that let me finish college from law school. Senator from Iowa, the same thing. And I have thought, goodness sakes, if that's how I reach this point in my life, other people deserve the same chance. So I have just been almost an automatic vote when it came to that kind of assistance. But now, and I want to thank the senator from Iowa, now that you've had these hearings, and I've joined you in investigating it, I find that a growing percentage of federal aid to education is going to for-profit schools that operate with 90% federal tax dollars and don't end up providing the kind of education that these young men and women need to succeed, and many of them end up defaulting on their student loans, so there they are with the debt and nothing to show for it, which I believe is the point you're making. So I'd say to my colleague from Iowa, a veteran himself, how can it be fair to the government or to the veterans for this kind of exploitation to continue? Well, I say to my friend from Illinois who has been a leader in this effort of looking at the for-profit industry and trying to get the facts out as to what's going on here so we can make reasonable decisions as legislators about protecting both the taxpayers' dollars and protecting students. I just say to my friend, on December the 8th, a few days ago, uh, our committee just uh, published this report called Benefiting Whom? For-Profit Education Companies and the Growth of Military Education Benefits. I, uh, I uh, suggest that you might want to take a look at that to see what's happening because the, the senator's absolutely right. More and more of this money is going for to the for-profit schools. Let me put it this way. Um, between 640 to $700 million in GI Bill benefits went basically to public institutions, you know, public schools, University of Illinois, Iowa State, University of Colorado, University of Georgia, all that. So about 640 to $700 million went to public schools. That supported 209,000 students. About the same amount of money from GI Bill benefits went to the for-profit schools, supported 75,000 students. So it's roughly three to one. Uh, it's, uh, it's roughly three to one. That's so right. So for every dollar that we spent through the Department of Defense to help veterans yes. in the GI Bill, right. if they went to a for-profit school, they were being charged three times exactly. what public schools were exactly. charging. The senator has it correct. And the numbers we found, incidentally, show that, for example, four of the five biggest schools receiving the most post-9-11 GI Bill funding have at least one campus with a student loan default rate above 24 percent over three years. And in comparison, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I believe when you look at the public schools, the default rates are in the 7 to 10 percent range. That's right. So more and more students being charged higher tuition, going deeper in debt, and defaulting at a rate of 3 to 1. Exactly. Being charged three times as much, defaulting three times as much as those who are attending public schools. It would seem to me that in a time of great national deficits, when we really do care about our veterans, this is an absolutely unexplainable, indefensible situation. Acceptable. And I thank the senator from Iowa for his hearings on this, and I ask him, at this point, where do we go from here in terms of these schools and in terms of what we should be asking of them to make sure that the students, the veterans, and the taxpayers get a fair shake? Well, I say to my friend from Illinois, again, I thank him for his focus on this issue for, for a long time and bringing it to our attention. Uh, again, uh, where are we going? Uh, we have some more hearings that we're going to be having after the first of the year. And then we're going to be looking at uh, legislation that we need to do. We need to take care of this. Uh, as I said earlier, our friend and former colleague, Senator Sam Nunn of Georgia, in 1992, had hearings on this very same subject. And we put in place some what we thought were fixes to straighten this industry out and to make sure taxpayers' dollars were better protected. Uh, almost all of those have been done away with. 
that the, the, the fixes that, that were made by Senator Nunn and this body, this Congress at that time. Uh, uh, we just really have to reexamine again uh, uh, those fixes and others. For example, as the Senator knows, in 1992, we put a ban on recruiting. In other words, you couldn't pay recruiters for how many students they recruited. Bounties. A bounty. Uh, that was rolled back in 2001. And then uh, we also had a, a provision before that... Uh, How many had to be campus-based? 90 percent had to be campus-based. We had a provision uh, that was put in the law then that more than 50 percent of your students had to be campus-based. More than 50 had to be campus-based. That was done away with in 2005. So all your students can be online. And since 2005, we've seen this huge explosion in online students uh, going to these private schools online. Uh, so those are just two of the things that, uh, that we made change, that, that have been rolled back. And I think we really have to re-examine that and re-examine how we better protect both taxpayers and the students. If I could ask one last question, Senator from Iowa. And so the U.S. Department of Education is looking at this. Yes. Secretary of Education Arne Duncan is looking into it. Yes. And you can't escape the reaction from the for-profit school industry. They're buying full-page ads in every newspaper they can get their hands on, claiming that we are, by this investigation, trying to deny an opportunity for education yes. for yes. particularly disadvantaged students. Isn't the bottom line here that we want to make sure that first schools are accredited, so that when they hold themselves out to offer a training program, certificate, degree, they in fact are doing that? Secondly, to make sure that they're charging a reasonable amount for the education that they're offering, Third, if you have so many defaults, it basically says your students are just accumulating debt, not accumulating diplomas, and we've got to bring that to an end. And they're asking about whether students end up in a job when it's all over, gainful employment. Are any of these unreasonable if the federal government is providing 90% of the revenues for these schools? I think the senator is being very reasonable. Uh, I think uh, these are the minimum kinds of things we had to do, uh, as I said, to be stewards of the taxpayers' money, uh, protect our veterans and protect other students. Uh, uh, one of the tricks that's in the trade, as they say, is, you know, I, I, I bet if I, if I ask the senator, I bet, I bet if I ask most senators here to describe a, a semester, what's a semester? Well, you'd think, well, a semester, that goes from usually from September to January is one semester, and maybe January to May is another semester, and then there's summer school. That's not it. A semester is what you, what you make it. Some of these schools have a semester that's five weeks long. So if you can keep your students in for 60% of the semester, you keep all their money. And then they drop out and they've got the money. Now this is something else that we've got to look at. Better definitions of what the time frames are here. What do we mean by a semester? How much time is that? And how much time does a student have to stay there before the school can keep the grants and keep the loans from the student? But again, these are things I think that our committee and and others we're going to have to wrestle with as we, uh, as we, uh, as we go ahead on this. I, uh, Mr. President, uh, I know others are backed up here to speak. I, I started a little bit late. I was supposed to start at 3.15. I think I started at 4.30, if I'm not mistaken. So I'll just take a few more minutes and try to close up. I know I don't want to keep other senators waiting. I, I, just, uh, I just, again, wanted to, uh, to just close on this, on the cost and debt. At these for-profit schools, many students don't leave with a degree, but most leave with debt. The average student attends for about 128 days before dropping out. That's a little over four months. That's the average. For most schools, that's two terms. That's enough time for students to rack up thousands of dollars in debt, anywhere from $6,000 to $11,000, depending on the program and the school. That's because for-profit schools are far more expensive than comparable programs at community colleges or public universities. The average tuition for a for-profit school is about six times higher than community college, twice as high as four-year public schools. Average annual tuition at a for-profit school was about $14,000 in 2009, while tuition at community colleges averaged about $2,500. And in-state four-year tuition was about $7,000. Of the 15 schools investigated by GAO, 14 had a higher tuition than the nearest public college offering a similar program. One that we looked at offered a, quote, computer-aided drafting certificate. Computer-aided drafting certificate. 
for $13,945. The same program at a nearby community college cost $520. The cost of an associate's degree offered by the second largest for-profit is over $38,000. And a bachelor's degree can cost up to $96,500. Again, I just, re I just uh, referenced uh, to the senator from Illinois the recent study that we had done uh, regarding the GIs and what the GIs are coming out, and, and they are. They're paying three, four, sometimes five times as much going to an online school as they could at a uh, community college or a, a local public or even a nonprofit uh, university. On the placement, I, Mr. President, I'm, I, I know I've, others are here and I, I don't want to, uh, to, again, hold them up. Uh, I mentioned, I talked about Senator Nunn, what he had done back in 1992. Uh, let me just uh, uh, respond on, on one thing on the accreditors. The senator from Illinois mentioned accreditation. Uh, I wanted to just respond to that because a lot of people think, well, only, if they're accredited, they must be all right. But here's what we found. All institutions of higher learning are governed by a combination of the Federal Department of Education, state agencies, and private accrediting agencies, which ought to act as a safeguard against the proliferation of high-cost, low-quality educational institutions. A few states have passed strong state authorization requirements, which have made it difficult for some questionable for-profit colleges to set up shop in those states. Unfortunately, those states are the exception rather than the rule. Accrediting agencies are charged with the mission of ensuring educational quality. However, this doesn't happen at a lot of for-profit schools. There are two types of accrediting agencies, the so-called national ones that focus on accrediting for-profit schools, and there are regional accreditors that accredit most public and nonprofit universities. Increasingly, for-profit schools are seeking regional accreditation. One particular regional accreditor, the Higher Learning Commission of the Middle States, accredits 18 of the 24 for-profit schools that have regional accreditation, and until recently was known as the go-to accreditor for for-profit schools. They have a cozy relationship. And we had a testimony from a witness employed by one of the, high, by one of the national higher education accrediting organizations. He testified, and I quote, accreditors must hold institutions accountable to ensure that only the highest level of integrity is injected into the student recruitment and admissions process. The same witness assured the committee that in 629 on-site 629 on-site evaluations over the previous 2 years, the agency did not find even a single example of substantial noncompliance. Yet this witness's organization accredits 3 of the schools documented by the GAO as having engaged in misleading or deceptive recruiting. So again, Mr. President, that's where we find ourselves. One quarter of our financial aid budget going to a sector dominated by education companies owned by investors and shareholders seeking to maximize short-term profit. Their mission is to grow and to get profits at the expense of positive student outcomes. There are virtually no legislative checks in place. Though new Department of Education regulations on incentive compensation is a step forward. The current accreditation bodies are ill-equipped to deal with the size and the relentlessness of investor-owned companies. As a consequence, as I just said, we have for-profit companies, quote, for-profit companies, financed without, with over 85 percent of taxpayer dollars, reaping $3.5 billion in profits. Millions of students leaving these schools with a debt but no diploma. These schools will receive more than $30 billion in federal aid this upcoming year. $30 billion. It seems to me it's the obligation of us here and federal regulators to provide effective government oversight and regulation of federal financial aid dollars. The public is watching to see whether Taxpayers' dollars are being used wisely and effectively. With high-cost schools and sky-high dropout rates, with limited job placement and services, I have grave doubts that many of these for-profit schools are a good taxpayer investment. At stake in the debate 
is the future of millions of Americans being aggressively recruited into high-cost programs of often dubious educational quality. For all of these reasons, for every Yasmin Issa who has been misled or defrauded by a for-profit college, we have an obligation to make sure these schools are doing a decent job for their students. We need for-profit schools that put the interests of their students first. We need for-profit education companies that strive to serve the needs of the students they recruit and enroll. That is not the case today. Congress and the executive branch have an obligation, I would say a moral obligation, to provide effective oversight of the for-profit sector in higher education. We owe this to the students, and we owe it to every taxpayer. Mr. President, I yield the floor.